Today, what I'm going to share with you is the title I hope is provocative regarding the intersection of identity, psychology, and research in confronting structural uh, discrimination. And if you can go to the next slide, uh, Josh. And so the focus of the presentation is I'm going to take you on a brief journey, but I hope it's going to be a helpful journey of my personal navigation of becoming a researcher in the context of structural barriers. Uh, because I think I didn't realize at the time that I was selecting what I wanted to do, what those barriers were, but I think it energized me to do what I have done. And then I'm going to end the session by talking about the importance of quantitative research to create societal change. Um, and then there's a, a Q&A. Uh, next slide. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. Uh, and I was born and raised at the foothills of Appalachian, Kentucky. I, I, uh, Dr. Penn was just asking me about that, a little small town called Crab Orchard, Kentucky. Most people don't think about black folks uh, living in Appalachia, but there are a bunch of us there. And, and I was a first generation college student. My parents had no more than an eighth grade education. However, what I think is interesting is this parental expectation about being well read. I read a lot and the expectation about having an advanced degree when they did not have one. Now, I will tell you, since growing up in Appalachia, most people did not go to college where I was at. And so I had ambition, but my focus was uh, fairly unknown. Uh, next slide. Now, I, you will see I have some quotes through here, but this was one that I think has stuck with me and I can't even find the, the origin of the quote, but the issue was I was compelled to think the moving about of great secret trunks. And I think that that's what thinking was to me, was unpacking um, ideas, unpacking uh, questions that I've had about lots and everything. Uh, next slide. Um, I enjoyed college because I like to think. I like psychology and, and research. I did not like rats. And just to tell you about that is that they had a rat lab and that's how I got my research experience of working in the rat lab. And one got away one day and that was not fun to try to catch a rat in a closed space. But uh, it did help me to shift my focus to clinical psychology for graduate work. So my master's degree is in clinical psychology from the University of Kentucky. Um, uh, next slide. So the master's degree in clinical psychology from the University of Kentucky. What was challenging, one of the cultural barriers I encountered was little focus on cultural issues. Uh, it was cross-cultural. My master's thesis was on racial differences. Uh, doing that, this, uh, that thesis, it was not supported. Um, I looked at uh, the, uh, whether uh, white and black men had a different perception of the of mental illness and the tolerance of deviance. And it was an experimental design and it was pretty advanced at that time. I mean, I, I was running Manovas for my master's thesis, but at the end of the day, when I finished it, the committee people said, we don't want you to do this because they had trouble of trying to interpret the findings because they wanted something to be simple in terms of white versus black and it wasn't. Um, I was discouraged to do a cultural dissertation. And at that point, it got really hard for me to want to finish that degree. So I switched to counseling psychology. Uh, and and there will be some interesting things about that because counseling psychology had been known to be much more culturally focused. So you can switch to the next slide. So I pursued a doctoral degree at Ball State University. And the irony about it was I was initially discouraged from conducting any cultural studies on blacks. And what it means is intracultural. Um, I, it, the irony, I was encouraged to do a comparative study. And I remember my response was, this is not my research. And I really stood my ground, I, you know, and you know, there was interesting things of saying, Beverly, you're trying to start a civil war. And I thought, if this is civil war, this is interesting. Um, but what I did was I switched doctoral chairs uh, and what I had wanted to do at that time was do scale development on black racial identity, but I was discouraged by black psychologists for realistic reason. And that was, you need to finish your degree because what I didn't realize at the time, scale development, if you do it well, is a long-term process. 
Now we still have people do dissertations for scale development, but a lot of times it's a one-off and you don't really develop a substantive scale. So the interesting thing for me was to begin to appreciate that finishing was going to be an important piece of getting past a cultural barrier because to not finish means that then I cannot contribute. To finish means I can contribute and do what I want to do. Um, and so I focused on white college student population, created a scale on career stuff. It, it really didn't turn out well, uh, the scale, it never got published, but I learned a heck of a lot about the process of research and what it would take to do good research. So I followed all the right steps it just so happened it wasn't a great scale. And so it was a good learning experience uh, for that uh, for me. Uh, next slide. So this is one of the things that I ended up with as I finished was thinking about being alive and being a woman and being colored is a metaphysical dilemma I haven't conquered yet. And I will never conquer it yet because it is just who I am. But instead of being concerned about that because we're all gonna experience barriers I just sort of said, I'm just going to persist, uh, persist. And so next slide. Next slide. So here's the, the companion to that one. When nothing seems to help, I go and look at a stone cutter hammering away at his rock, perhaps a hundred times without as much as a crack showing in it. Yet the hundred and first blow, it will split in two. And I know it was not the last blow that did it, but all that had gone before. And these two quotes, the last two quotes, were my mantra through graduate school. Have to know who you are. You have to know that it's going to be challenging. My coffee pot is going off, folks, if you hear a noise, it, it's, it's turned off. So you have to know you're gonna encounter barriers, but you have to know whether you're willing to persist because anything you're gonna be successful at, persistence is the name of the game. Um, next slide. So once I left uh, the, uh, got my doctorate degree, my first postdoctoral position was at the University of Notre Dame Counseling Center. And that was fine because I needed to get licensed in the first place, but I knew research was my passion and so did my advisor. And sometimes advisor knows uh, know what you need. She just started sending my name to universities. <laughs> You know, they were looking for somebody who was doing my research. And so she just re send out names. And one of the places was at Penn State. They recruited me to apply for an academic position. And what they dangled in front of me, little did they know, was William E. Cross Jr. And William E. Cross Jr. had been one of my all time favorite research. It's why I had wanted to do racial identity scale development. And so when I uh, interview there, we met, and I was just so enthralled with the possibilities of, of creating a scale to match the iteration of his theory that I was glad that he supported that. And, and that's how I wound up going to Penn State versus other places, the, the opportunity to work uh, with William Cross. Next slide. An older version of, a younger version of me, <laughs> why uh, did I want to do this? Well, it's a professional challenge. And it also had to deal with about the perception of cultural psychology research. Next slide. So let me give you a little background information. Cross's original aggressance model published in Negro World in 1971. And he wrote this little theory based upon his uh, experiences of the civil rights movements in the 60s. Now, he followed that up with Hall and Friedel, uh, creating a list of short statements that he used in the Q sort experiment. And if people don't want to know what a Q sort is, is that they would have these cards, they give them to people, and they'd ask them to uh, uh, put them in piles, me, not me, undecided. And then you'd look at those to see what kind of configuration that they were creating with the items they selected. Um, the items were used in the early version of the racial identity attitude scale called the RAS by Parham and Helps in the 80s. And they had asked Cross for the items and he gladly gave it to them. 
the RIAS made the negrescence model well known because as you know, you can have a theory if you don't measure it, then it's not as used as much as if there's one that's measurable, that's operationalized. So it has become one of the most heavily used black racial identity scale. Helms used the negrescence model and the scale to create her own model. So you would have to go to see how she expanded it and then also expanded to the people of color racial identity and also white racial identity theory and scale. Next slide. Now, the problem was that the empirical research on the Reyes uh, was vast uh, during the late 90s up through, I would say, the early 2000s. And the psychometric evidence did not support the reliability and validity of the scores. I mean, it was pretty vast. Uh, Helm's response was to question the adequacy of classical test theory methods in capturing the complexing dynamics of racial identity. And I remember experiencing those time because I graduated in 93 and then began to do scale work in 95. And it was pretty intense, the debate. Uh, next slide. So here's the question I had to ask myself. Were the critiques legitimate? Were the cr critiques culturally biased? And I'd be interested if, if people threw some stuff through the chat, what were your thoughts? What are your thoughts about the problem um, uh, about that? So if you do have one. Uh, were the critiques legitimate? Uh, next slide. Um, uh, no, that, that's probably, well, I, let me just do this. Uh, uh, go to the next slide and then I'll come back to this one. My thoughts. Um, I think that the critique was legitimate to the degree that the evidence did not support uh, the scale. I also thought that the critique that it was culturally biased was also there. And the reason why I say that, then Josh, go back to the last slide that I had you to skip. Thank you. Does the psychometric evidence support the use of these measures? And I would tell you it does not. And I just put a smattering down there. The Rorschach has been used for years and probably is being used less, but I was trained on the Rorschach and the evidence is not there even for Exner's uh, approach. The TAT, the same thing, maybe a nice interesting thought process. Myers-Briggs, they have never found support for the 16 types. They can find support for each individual scale but not in terms of those typologies that they use to make predictions. Um, and the grit, which is one of the latest one that has taken the world by storm, because everybody goes about saying, are you gritty enough and blah, 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 ton of money, but meta-analysis does not support the predictive nature of the scale, nor the uh, factor structure. In fact, they think that they're probably not three, but two, but it's used a lot. And so now we have the problem being, how is it that one scale about racial identity sparks not only the research, but a lot of accurate comments that you have some longstanding scales and even current scales that still does not meet the academic or empirical standards, but you don't have the noise about it. Are y'all with me so far? And so that's the piece that sort of drove me to think about this is the challenge. How do you engage researchers to start thinking about cultural issues where it doesn't raise or hackle as if this needs to be interrogated more than mainstream things that people have closed their eyes to. Um, uh, move two slides forward, uh, I think, yes. So my goal at that point was to do two things. One was to create a unidimensional scale within a multidimensional scale. And that may be hard to think about, but it had, there was at least six subscales 
And the goal was to make sure that each subscale could hold up on its own, but it needed to be in an umbrella of measuring racial identity. That's a hard thing to do. And that was one of the critiques of the Reyes that the scales collapsed and they were not measuring separate constructs. And to get to that uh, unidimensionality within a multidimensionality scale, then you had to have low subscale correlations. And my goal was to have it less than 0 0.30. I wanted to tap less than 10%. Now that people say that's pretty low, but you have to start thinking in research terms about sampling. You know, you gotta start thinking about the bigger picture because when you sample, you are going to get a distribution of scores. And so you're gonna have some that, are, that have some high correlations and you're gonna have some that have low correlations. So you can't assume that from one sample or two samples, if you get a correlation of less than 0 0.30, then you're all set. Again, that was one of the other problems with prior scales. You have got to anticipate, you get go low as you can. So it's gonna create a distribution of scores where you don't want it to be at the upper end. So you're gonna find a range, but you don't want it to be in the upper end. So if you take 0 0.5, 0 0.6, already you're at a midpoint of a correlation that if you do a sampling distribution, your possibility are going to get some high correlation between the items or the scales. Are y'all following me? So the other goal was re high, high reliability estimates of the scores with the alpha level being greater than 0 0.80. Same reason, if you start with low reliability estimates, you're going to stay that way because there's no way that you can go up that you're going to either be tapping a lot more error than you want to have. And then of course you want a stable factor structure that if you repeatedly do this, that the, what I tell people, the items are going to stay in their neighborhood. They're not going to go and escape to another group or leave the family. Um, and then the goal is to sort of create predictive validity and practical utility. That was the challenge that was ahead. Next slide. It still did what I was trying to get it. Click, click it again, Josh. The picture should come in. I thought I'd taken that transition out, ah, but it is. This is William E. Cross Jr. He is now a professor emeritus uh, at the University of Denver. He's one of the leading figures in racial identity research. He was a Princeton doctoral student when he came, when he created the theory. And what I tell people that uh, theorizing and research is possible at all ages. You just got to be bold enough uh, to do that. And I was impressed the fact that he, he did this theory when he was a doctoral student at Princeton. And so it was first published in 1971. Next slide. Here's our research team. And when we started in 1995, the asterisks are the people who continue to be the uh, primary Chris team. Uh, but Leon Caldwell and Penny Fagan Smith were uh, doctoral students at the time. And of course, uh, Dr. Cross is in personality uh, and Janet Swim was in social psychology. She's still there well known for her prejudice and discrimination research. Frank Worrell is uh, in school psychology. And of course I was in counseling psychology. So you have this interdisciplinary team and, and Penny is a developmental psychologist and Leon was in counseling. So you had this interdisciplinary team focused on looking at uh, racial attitudes. Next uh, slide. So how did we do this? This was a four year, five year project. And so I am relieved that I did not do this for my dissertation because I still would be in school. So uh, this was a long-term project. People worried because I devoted my time to this. And as a result, they were worried about me getting tenured. There's not ways, not too many ways that you can get a lot of publication real quickly if you're doing scale de de development research and you want to do it well. Because we created items, we had discussions, we uh, shifted, we had more discussions, and then we send them out to expert judges and we'd have criteria for in conclusion. We had to get an 80% agreeance that they fail within a subscale and not others. And then we would go back and revise the items. And then we did a series of content analyses. We'd collect data on small groups of African-American students because we couldn't shoot our wad because we knew we were gonna have difficulty finding a lot of African-American uh, students. 
So we did a series of content analyses, reliability estimates, and we do some correlation analysis and uh, to get to that point. Next slide. And then as we move toward finding that we had more consistency among the items, we moved to do an exploratory factor analysis on the subscales and then the scale. And that is a key point that a lot of people don't do. And I was fortunate that I had some scale developers uh, at Penn State that knew this really well. To get a multidimensional scale, and then you have unidimensionals within a scale, you really have to do individual factor analysis on the subscale to make sure that those items are sticking together and kicking the others out. And I pretty have a, had a pretty strict criteria. I took nothing with the structure coefficient below um, 0.50. And again, why? Because if you're going to be sampling over and over again, you want your best items that have that stability. And a lot of times people will keep uh, items that have a structure coefficient of 0.30. Well, it's likely then if it's 0.30, it could get lower. You know, and it, the, the, the ceiling is going to be lower. So you want the best pool of items to do that. And then when we did confirmatory factor analysis, as you will see, I turned the scale upside down. I tested every possible model because people would like to test their own model, but don't test other possible models for alternatives. And we wanted to know whether there was any alternative than what had been theorized. And we did a, a series of con construct validity with doing convergent discriminant validity. Next slide. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit background on the construct itself because it'll help you in terms of how as I present some of the research. The, the original Gresson model was a five stage model. It was treated like that as if it's developmental and it is not and you'll see the changes and pre encounter just sort of describes somebody who had not thought about race, not thought about that as being their social identity. And then the next stage was that they would experience a series of encounters that would get them to question their role. Had they been discriminated against, whether someone had said something to them. And the choice was they could either move back to pre-encounter or move forward uh, to be in a stage, stage where they would immerse themselves in being black. And as they immerse themselves in being black, they would question also being uh, white in the white uh, system. And it was more considered a very affective laden stage. And then the immersion part coming out was more cognitive based that they would be a cooling off of being angry and mad about racism, but coming to being internalized about being black. And the internalized commitment was about uh, whether you would become an activist out in the community. And then PARM uh, added in 89 a recycling component, which that you could have other encounters. And if you did, you could start recycling back through the process. Um, so that's the essence of that model. Uh, next slide. And this gives you a full way of thinking about it. And with the pre-encounter uh, is was considered almost binary that either either if you were pro-white, that meant it was equivalent to being anti-black. And then with the immersion, immersion, if you were pro-black, it was equivalent to being anti-white. Next slide. One of the things I loved about William Cross's work is that he was a consummate scholar and a theoretician. And so he decided with some critique that other people had made about his theory to go back and do an exhaustive review of the scholarly literature. If you are interested in doing black identity research, it is a requirement that you read Shades of Black. It is the consummate uh, book on looking at black identity. He did an exhaustive review of the scholarly literature and black identity going all the way back as far as he could go with the, before the Kent and Clark, the Clark studies and he moved people through this analysis to why he revised the scale, uh, not the scale, revised the theory. And so this is the revised and model in 1991. And he started doing more theorizing uh, to set the plate for looking at the, 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 the attitudes. 
And so he basically said that self-concept is a combination of a personal identity with the reference group orientation. Now, some of this research goes back and his connection is to Erickson as well as to Tafel that is in social psychology, which is equivalent to social identity, but he broadened that. And the personal identity is the characteristics you have as a person. We all have traits. And so you're talking about self-esteem, you're talking about being outgoing, you're talking about being agreeable, all the big five fits under personal identity and any kind of psychological issues you have. The reference group orientation is about your relationship to others, the social identity. Who do we affiliate with? And many times we don't even ask ourselves why we affiliate. We know that these are the people we prefer. And I tell people when they're having trouble thinking about racial identity as, a, and a, as part of their, uh, 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 a part of who they are, I tell them to start thinking about the things that matter to them. Did you join a sorority when, or a fraternity when you were in school? Do you attend church? What type of church you attend? Do you have an affiliation uh, for a particular um, political party, which is resonant in lots of people's mind? Do you have a clear idea of gender, uh, of a gender identity? All of these fall under a social identity. It's who we use as our reference group of relating to the world. Okay, and it varies. And for being black or being brown, uh, race, being racialized, because that's what has happened in this country based upon skin tone, uh, phenotypical characteristics, it's resident in many uh, people colored mind. And it may not be as much in whites, but until recently where whiteness has become an issue. But before the social identity of many blacks have been about race. He also challenged the linkage that continues to exist today between black identity and psychological health. He had initially uh, theorized that if you were anti-black, then that meant that you were psychologically unhealthy. If you were pro-white, that meant you were psychologically unhealthy. And that only health was related to uh, being pro-Black. Okay. Um, and, and he began to challenge that notion that he did not believe that was true anymore. And this is still the piece that researchers are grappling with, the evidence versus this intuitive appeal that they think this is such a linear process, that you're going from, uh, from bad to good. Um, he also proposed multiple identities at each stage. And what Cross started thinking about is that he did not believe that any scale or any theory could ever capture the universal aspects of racial identity, of identity, because he said there's so many possibilities of configurations. And so what he could propose at best would be some exemplars of some primary identities that you would see but that you shouldn't be surprised to see uh, various unique combinations. And then the status of black nationalism. In his original theory, he proposed that he thought anybody who was too pro-black really immersed. And I think this was based upon the Black Panthers and all that, that was going on in the 60s. He called them vulgar nationalists, vulgar black nationalists. And the, the, the black nationalist community were pretty upset about that because they felt like that it was possible to be a black nationalist and be healthy and not be perceived as negative. And so he revised that thinking. Next slide. So here is the revised model. And so what you begin to see is he is now making some delineation that pre-encounter he was talking about assimilation and anti-black. And if you notice what he's done, he has did a separation where they had sort of blended pro-white or pro-American with anti-black, he separated them and said, it's possible for someone to be pro-American and not even think about being anti-black. It's possible for someone to be anti-black and never think about being assimilated. 
So he started delineating that. Encounters the experiences and that, and it's not something you can measure. Immersion, immersion, he separated those two. It, it was possible, he thought, for people to be bro, pro black without necessarily being anti white. And so he separated those two. And then internalizations, he started thinking about there were multiple ways that people could internalize being black. Some might be from a nationalist point of view, some might be from a bicultural, I'm American and I am black, and by some by multicultural by saying, I'm American, I'm black, but I'm also gay. And so he saw that there were multiple ways that people could integrate being black into their identity. Next slide. And so now uh, this is what I'm showing you is now the expanded model. The expanded model just went a little bit further and this expanded model went further because of the scale development we did. It also shows that theory uh, can be challenged and changed based upon research. And he did not expect this. And so the anti-Black separated into miseducation and self-hatred. And that's just from the research. That's how people responded to the scale. The items split. They did not hold together as just being anti-Black. And then of course, the immersion, immersion attitudes, um, the ones with the asterisks are the ones that we've been able to measure. And I, I, I should go back and re-asterisk this because uh, we now are gonna, we have a, a new scale coming out with intense black involvement. We've been working on it. And the Afrocentric and the multicultural inclusive. And the reason why we only focus on those two, it is hard to delineate by culturalist from a multiculturalist because once people have more than uh, one identity, it's hard to separate uh, what that other uh, separation is. Next slide. So here are a list or a sample of items for from the scale. So for assimilation, I think of myself primarily as an American, seldom as a member of a racial group. Uh, miseducation, Blacks place more emphasis on having a good time. Uh, 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 then on hard work, self-hatred, I sometimes have negative feelings about being black. Next slide. I hate white people. Uh, th these are some of the cleanest items because it's, you know, if people don't like something, it's easier to tap that than what people have murky feelings about. Afrocentric, black people would never be free until we embrace an Afrocentric perspective. Multiculturalists, I believe it's important to have both a black identity and multicultural perspective, which is inclusive of everyone. Example, Asians, Latinas, gays, lesbians, Jews, and whites. Now, let me just share with you, I broke a number of scale development one-on-one -on -one rules. I'll just tell you that I broke them. And there was a reason why I broke those rules uh, is that usually good scale development means that the items need to be clear enough that you do not tap multiple things in one item. And if you notice on the multicultural inclusive and on the assimilation item, there are multiple things going into the scale. Why is that? Well, Helms is right. Black identity is complicated and there are a number of dynamics there. And if you don't take into account those compl complications, it's hard to measure. So one of the problems that, that Helms had was the scales collapsed because there was hard to get a delineation between them. One of the things I recognized as we were working on them is that when you write items and you're writing uh, across dimensions, you've got to make sure as you write one item in one dimension that you write another item that pushes them away, that pushes them away. Because if you don't push them away, then they're going to wind up being part of the same scale. So what we recognized that there had been in the prior research, a high correlation between the assimilation items and the multicultural inclusive. So how do you delineate somebody who really doesn't think being black is that important? So we recognize that we had to make the multicultural scale laden with race, laden with things that an assimilationist wouldn't respond to. And that's why we put those other things there. Because if we wrote, I believe it's important to have a black identity, it is possible for an assimilation to say, well, yeah, I'm black. You know, it may not guide my life, but yeah, it's important, okay? But by putting in Asians, Latinas, 
lesbian, Jews, and whites, we're now uh, focusing on race as being important. And so we wanted them to, the items to push away, and they do. The correlations between assimilation and multiculturalism is not fair. But it, this was a daring move to make, given the fact that I violated the rules of, of, of development. But what was interesting about this process is also what I learned in putting those items there. When we initially did this, many people were not multiculturalist inclusive. They would mark out gays, uh, lesbians, Jews, and whites. And then the students would still answer the item. <laughs> and what we were found was fascinated about that is they were focused on a multicultural racial. Uh, their, their attitude was not inclusive of other people beyond race. And it was a fascinating thing to see a number of students who did that. Uh, next slide. So this is a compilation. This is not just of what we first found, but I wanted to give you a sense of the uh, pattern over time. And so if you see the sample sizes have ranged from 140, from 105, it's a little small study we did, to uh, a sample as large as 388, and that you will see the reliability estimates for the scores. And as you notice, you know, our goal was to get to 0 0.80. We didn't necessarily get there, but these are pretty stable in terms of being pretty consistent, starting at 0 0.70 and up. And you don't see anything in the 0 0.60 range. You don't see in the 0 0.50 range. And this was the problem with the Helm, the Reyes scale, that the reliability estimates were sometimes as low as 0.18. So what are you really tapping? And this for social uh, attitudes measure is pretty good because a lot of social attitude measures, the, the reliability estimates are in the, in the dumps. And the Car Gardner kit and Worrell was with uh, adolescent uh, uh, students. So that was the interesting thing about it. Next slide. This is a short-term stability uh, uh, one I did, and it, it ranged from getting them to do a time one to time two for 14 to 45 days with a medium of 21 days. And one of the things I think it's noteworthy to think about, most people, if you're gonna do test retest, do not get as many people to return. So the sample size is 310, I had an 88% return rate. And people are like, how did you do that? Well, one of the things I did is I paid them. And I paid them more money to return than I paid them to start. And they filled out more items the first time around with less money. But, and I paid them more to, for a smaller scale. So I paid them $5 the first time around. I paid them $10 the second time around but I had an 88% return rate. So which means that these are uh, a pretty stable. And so if there's two things you want to notice about this pattern. One is on the diagonal, of course, are the test retest reliabilities. And if you'll see, they're all the ranges between 0.73 and 0.86. And of course you would expect that anyway, given the fact that this is between 14 to 45 days. So the fact is that this is a short time period you'd expect that to be high. Most, most scales can't show this evidence. And then the other thing I want you to pay attention to is one of the goals was to get a low uh, correlation between the subscales. You will see that uh, the highest is between multiculturalist and anti-white, and it's inversely related. And, and we knew that, but if it, you know, but 0 0.40 isn't bad. We wanted to be at 0 0.38. 3-0, but if you notice all the rest of them, they're pretty doggone low. And in particular, you look at the relationship between assimilation, which is PA, uh, and multiculturalist is IMCI, the correlation is 0 0.10. And this pattern has continued to be the case over time. Um, and so you see this process that I'm unfolding. Are you with me so far? Next slide. Uh, let me see. These are a list of the structural validity studies that we did from uh, EFAs to CFAs and, uh, and we continue to work on this. In fact, we have a publication coming out because we uh, just added a new scale to the CRIS and then 
you know, the one I mentioned, that's the one I'm working on now. And so we wanted to make sure there was stability. Go to the next slide. Now, uh, you know, uh, depending on where you're looking, if you'll notice this, uh, this was the first uh, set of confirmatories I did in 2002. And I tell people, you have to beat up a scale. If you don't beat up the scale, then why bother? And so I test every possible possibilities there were to see whether what we had done would fit. And if you notice, we did beside a, a, a one factor model, we did a two factor, we did a three, we did a four, we did a five, we did a six. Uh, and you notice once we got to six, you know, we got a fairly good fit, you know, cause we were just, just under 0.95. And I, our misfit with the REMSEA was pretty good, uh, but we did a first and second order. Of course, you know, we realized at this point, if you do a first and second order, it usually is not gonna be good as, as the um, first order model, but we wanted just to test that. Um, next slide. Uh, let me see, gotta make sure. Uh, and, and that pattern that I showed you with the factor analysis, has held to this day. So the, I, I forgot to list the number of, um, of studies that have been done that has continued to show that. Now, why do I think those EFAs and CFAs were successful? Because of what I talked about, the reliability estimates over time, getting them high, because reliability is the ceiling for validity. The second piece was doing the EFAs singularly for every scale early on before we did the multidimensional scale, before we put them all together. We wanted to know that each scale had those items were going to work best. And then we went to doing a full scale EFA. Now, one of the other things I will tell you about research on racial identity, again, Helms is correct that this is a complicated and dynamic construct. And one of our concerns was the fact that once you scale it, how do you interpret it? And we did not believe that doing a subscale, a, a set of items and, and scoring them and saying this is what fits was going to give you that. And so our belief was that every subscale needed to be accounted for. And so these are a number of studies that we have done profile uh, or cluster analysis on. Now, I know right now the big deal is the latent class cluster analysis, but um, we did cluster analysis, but we used a program that, pe it's a little small program that people hadn't heard of, but if anybody knows McDermott's work, uh, and I think I saw Eric uh, 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 on the chat line here, Eric knows McDermott's work, uh, and he also knows Marley Watkins' work, who is one of my great colleagues. And so we use McDermott's uh, uh, MEG clustering system that is pretty rigorous in terms of creating blocks of uh, subsamples and, uh, uh, and then using those blocks to do different clusterings to come up to a, a more stable clustering. And so we continue to use that today. I think that, you know, we probably should look at doing it late in class cluster analysis, but I think that uh, McDermott works is, uh, is great. So all of these, I think Whitaker and Neville did just SPSS clustering, but the rest of us, uh, because I know TELUS worked with Worrell and the rest of us did the MEG clustering. Uh, next page. These are the clusters uh, that just gives you an idea of how we started to think about the clustering. And um, uh, we first standardized all the raw scores to be T scores. So, you know, mean of 50, standard deviation of 10. And then um, we um, sort of put them in a profile for you to be able to see. And, and we did discussions and we looked at uh, how we could interpret these. And so if you notice the multiculturalist, um, there's an elevation on the IMC scale, but very little on others. You had a low race salient scale, you know, where almost everybody, and we've seen it where everything has just been under uh, zero. We've done this, I think they turned this into a, 
uh, z-scores just to be able to show where the zero is. And so you get an idea of these possibilities of, again, different clusters that we have found. You see nine on this page. Now, if you go to the next page, Josh, over seven studies, you will see um, the frequencies of these uh, clusters where the low race aliens popped up in six of the seven, where the multiculturalists popped up in five of the seven. And so we know that there are some clustering when you are sampling seem to be uh, more possible or more prevalent in these samples where others we find some unusual ones that haven't popped up before. And so it gets back to um, Cross's contention that there's a universe of uh, possibilities of identities. It's just a question of beginning to understand those and being able to sample broadly to get there. Uh, next uh, slide. One of the other things we wanted to do is begin to think about um, prediction. And so we started doing clustering and then looking at predictions. And this is with um, a, a college population. We had 287, we did some clustering on, and we asked them to respond to perceived experience of racial discrimination. Now, this is not an experiment, so this, there's no causality here. It's about prediction of from one self-report to another. So there's some downside to that, but we did uh, two things. Once we did the clustering, we did a descriptive discriminant analysis. Because again, when you're in a multivariate world, you need to stay there. And because if you go and make it all about the subscales, you're no longer thinking about composites. And a lot of people don't want to go there. But this is the complexity of racial identity, breaking through and thinking less simplistically about it. So these are clusters that we put in uh, doing what we, people call an upside down MANOVA. And where you're looking to see if the uh, factor separates based upon the composite of the scores. And what you'll see, the interesting thing is we came out with one, um, one uh, variant they would call uh, and that the people split based upon this variant, low perception, the assimilated sort of went there. And in the middle of the Afrocentric, the multiculturalist, the immersion self-hating, are basically just like uh, you know, perceived experience, maybe, maybe not. And those with the high per perception of, of, of experiences are those that were intense black involvement. This is theoretically what we would have wanted to see. How did this split up? How did we come to understand people's perception? Next slide. I'm almost done. Uh, and in fact, I may have to hurry up a little bit. Um, and so this is another one we did about majority group and pr uh, preferences. And this was on a social distance uh, measure that we created, uh, a Gutman. And we wanted to know it, how people would prefer. And so you have a low preference, a minority in preference versus a high. Again, this is a, de a descriptive uh, discriminant analysis. And you find that the multicultures fall in the middle. The IBI, it says, you know, intense, I don't want to be part of the majority. And then the assimilating, the self-hating was saying, yeah, we, we're wanting to be part of the majority. And, and so I think it was just an interesting pattern. Uh, Josh, I'm going to ask you, we're going to skip some scales. And, and, and you have the, the PowerPoint. So if people want it, uh, you're welcome to look at it. Uh, go to, uh, just move up about two slides for me. Uh, no, one more. So what are the current directions? Well, I've created a social desirability scale because in this day and age, everybody's gonna say they're a multiculturalist. So how to begin to attenuate that effect. We've also created two additional racial identity scales, race salience and intense black immersion. The race salience is going to be uh, published soon. And then we have, and I'm working on the second manuscript where we have, we're doing a two part study where we've collected two different sets of data where we're doing exploratory in one, confirmatory in the next, and then cluster analysis for all, and then looking at different predictions. And then we've also expanded to look at racial ethnic identities across all ethnic groups, because it's called the cross scale of social scores. And we have an adolescent version and adult version. Next slide. 
So here's the preliminary analysis that we've done with this scale. Uh, and so we've had US adolescents, European Americans, and if Frank goes to New Zealand, and so we collected data on New Zealanders, and, and then we've had, that's for adolescents, and then we've done some adults, uh, African American, Asians, European. And so you begin to see some promising findings regarding um, the uh, FIT index. This is for the six factor model and for the misfit. So that's where we're currently at. And we just got a paper accepted for one of these. I can't remember which one. Um, uh, the take home message is here. Next slide. Cultural issues can be quantitatively measured. Uh, the myth persists that cultural research is weaker than non-cultural research. I say nay to that. Uh, what is non-cultural research? Because my contention is that all research is cultural. You just got to know what context you're dealing with. And the myth that qualitative research is the best approach for cultural research. I think if you want to have a richer understanding of what you're looking at, mixed methods are fine. But I think that we need to push the discourse about the fact that all research is cultural, all research is contextual. What is the context? What do you want to know? Next slide. This is one that I was looking at, one of the things that I saw some epistem uh, uh, epistemic bias, and that would be the one thing that I questioned. I think quantitative methodology or a positive approach is not solely the venue of the social sciences, or I would say Western psychology. I think it's not the venue of Western social science. And my question I tell people, who built the pyramids? You know, the earliest known description of the brain, they can track back to Egypt. Alexandra had the library of Alexandra. People would come from all over. So then the, what was being uh, 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 developed in Africa began to be known as Greek science. And so I don't think that people have gone back a lot. Now, of course, Western has put their influence on it. Uh, next slide. I give you a number of things to read if you want to talk about some of the scientific systems in Africa. But I think the problem is that when research gets tagged or quantitative gets tagged as a European invention, then it sort of pushes people to think that that's not how they should think. When scientific method is scientific method and that what you have to be aware of that it's always contextualized because if you don't get contextualized, how do you know who it generalizes to and for whom? Um, some of the things that are challenging about cultural research, access to the target population and sample size. And if you notice, I always try when I'm doing factor analysis, I have large samples. I had at least 300, 400. Right now I'm sitting on a data set of 428 African-Americans. And, and people say, how do you do that? Well, you've got to be able to understand how are you going to get your target population? Uh, the issue of reliability and validity should be generalizable to any cultural group because if you can't tap what you're measuring, then you can't speak for that group. I think there's a limited understanding of the cultural features context to draw appropriate conclusions. And one of the things that I worry about is the limitations of advising because when cultural issues are encountered, many times advisors say, well, you just go to it and whatever they do, it gets blessed. And it's not because they don't care, it's a lack of knowledge, of feeling uncomfortable of trying to now interpret in a cultural range. And then one of the things is the rest restricted development of quantitative research skills. Uh, the point and click statistical software is a problem. Online pro uh, platforms are a problem. Not that we shouldn't do any of those, but if you don't know your limitations about either one of those, then it becomes part of the problem. Um, my biggest worry right now, we're governed by our beliefs, not about what can be tested. All beliefs may be true. Uh, keep going, uh, Josh. I'm, I'm now ahead of you. I've gotten on a roll. Okay, sorry. Next slide. Okay, so my worry is all beliefs may be true, but for whom and for what? And that's what doesn't get questioned anymore. If somebody says it, then it must be true. And I go like, why? Uh, we need to lean into knowing quantitative methods well if we're ever going to, if the goal is to be a practitioner, because there's great research out there, but we need to make it accessible because people leave uh, programs, clinical programs and counseling programs, and they never take another look at research. 
So they do what they do, but that's not being a good scientist or a practitioner. And I think clinical assessment of interest should not be based on beliefs and solely on experience. Um, next slide. Uh, I'm, you know, I do think the scientific method and quantitative methods matter. I think it matters to understanding the cultural lives of people and to advance the quality of life of those who've been marginalized. I think COVID-19 has laid bare the disparities that we have got to address. Uh, and then we need to keep up with knowledge. We need to read, read more, read even more. And, and you need to question what you're told, question what you read, question your experiences. Uh, Cause I think at times that people think that what they know, what they read, it's the gospel. And I don't think, and you have to be willing to make mistakes to deal with the discomfort or not knowing or being wrong. And that's particularly in cultural research. You're not gonna get it right. And that it's a long-term uh, process. And the, the next slide, which is my last slide, is the process of current research. This is how I got to where I got, because we started with a theory, we did the measurement, we interpreted, and we let the interpretation guide us back to theory, we revised the theory, and we're still out measuring. And that the process works regardless of the culture you're working with. You just have got to get baptized in that and contextualized. So I'm done. Uh, question and answers, folks. Uh, I'll be glad to take them. I don't know how we do this, you know, because I've never done this before. Let me see. I'm going to put up, pull up the chat. People are, so first of all, thank you so much. Everyone is clapping. Many people are clapping. Uh, thank you. I want to take a moment to acknowledge that. And um, we have about 15 minutes. And so I want to invite people who would like to speak up, speak up or type in the chat. I will uh, monitor, me and the other reps, uh, we will monitor the chat. So I'd like to open it up to anybody who has, I have a whole sticky note desk full of questions, but I want to let everyone else have a chance because scale development is my jam, but I want to let everyone else have a chance to ask questions. So please. And this isn't a question, but just I just wanted to thank you so much, Beverly. That was fantastic. Thank um, you. This is fun for me. You know, I, I'm a research geek at heart. This is really fun <laughs> to talk about uh, statistics and research and how you can move it forward and, and for it to have a cultural base and not be scared of the process. And I think there's a bunch of research geeks here as well who, who probably have some questions, but I know they've been very inspired by things. I like the one that uh, that Eric said he knocked uh, knocked me off my yoga ball. <laughs> <laughs> You're funny, Eric. <laughs> Any questions? Violent reactions, as I would say. I have a question that's not um, very useful to really anybody but me, but since no one's talking, I'm going to go ahead and ask it. So lesson to everybody who didn't talk. Um, I um, <laughs> was wondering if you could talk, I mean, it was like amazing. It was like a master class in skill development. That was so awesome to listen and be present for. Um, I was wondering if you can talk a little bit. I've been thinking, um, you know, occasionally about doing skill development and I'm, I, it's, I, I'm not the right person for that. And so I'm, I'm wondering if somebody came to you saying like, there's something I'd like to measure. I can't find a scale for it. I want to start doing that myself. What do you sort of recommend as some first steps? Like, how do you, how do you recommend beginning? I'm a professor, but as a if I was a student or professor at any level, like how do you sort of recommend getting started? There are two, two things that I would recommend. They three things I'd recommend them do. One is I think they need to take a measurement class and they may need to take two because it is really important to understand the whole concept of, of the, the guidelines of measurement, classical test theory, IRT. They need to understand that because to not have that knowledge is not gonna help you. You know, understanding reliability estimates, knowing that it's a foundation. I find it challenging when people uh, send me manuscripts and they're not even thinking sequentially so they give me validity work, but before they've even told me they've established reliability. And I'm telling them, you need to flip the script. So I think that having a foundation in measurement is important. I think to um, reading, uh, I, I will tell you a book that it will surprise everybody that I used, but in, in graduate school and then expanded is the little small scale development book by Develos. Uh, B-E-V-E-L-L, -L, and it's all, it's just names 
published by Sage called Scale Development. It's no bigger than this. It's a little tiny book, but it talks about uh, the, the developing of a construct and and then what do you do to sort of test that? And that's, that's a really good beginning book uh, for scale development. And then the third is they're gonna have to take some stats classes. I mean, because some of that is going to mean leaning into structural uh, uh, to factor analysis, uh, EFAs as well as CFAs, IRT, depending on how they want to do it. So those are the three things. Uh, but I also would tell them, you know, I think consultation works because I would go back to the measurement people had taught me when I was in graduate school and I met with them on a regular basis. Again, be, it's important not to be scared to not know and to be willing to fail. And so I would go back and they said, well, Beverly, that's not gonna work. And a lot of times right now, students struggle with competence and thinking that if they don't show how well, well they know things that people are gonna think they're dumb. And I have found the other part refreshing and freeing. I, I don't mind people thinking I'm dumb as long as I get where I need to go. So I think that that piece freeing yourself to ask stupid questions. So I have people coming to me and asking, and, and sometimes some things are difficult to measure. And I've told some students that. Um, one student wasn't happy when they came and they wanted to create a biracial measure for uh, young kids. And I said, this is almost an impossible task. And if you're gonna do it, you shouldn't be doing it as a graduate student. And so she was upset because other people could say, oh, this is a great idea. Well, the unfortunate thing is they, they weren't scale developers. And so they're telling her to go do something that was going to probably require a massive five to seven years, you know, biracial identity in kids. And she just thought she could do it by giving them a, 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 a workbook and getting them to read. It was gonna be more difficult than that. The issue of stability, the issue of cognitive development, you know, what age range you're talking about. And it was gonna be a very difficult haul. She finally didn't do it, but she was not happy with my response because some things are really hard to do unless you have a lot of time. Hope that answered your question. Yeah. We have a question in the chat. Um, Andrea uh, Hassong asks, uh, can you say something in all of this about how you actually select the wording for the items? That seems to be the, the less clear part. That's a really good question. And, and I would tell you, I, I will be honest, uh, as an assistant professor running a research team of such esteemed people like William Cross, some of this is a blur because I still, as I look back over it, I can't believe that I was actually telling senior professors what to do. And, you know, ignorance is bliss. I didn't think about rank at that time. I only thought about the process. What we did was this, we did two things. Um, we broke up in teams and people took different constructs. And we were asked to go back and reread the literature on each of these constructs. And then, then we got together as a team and we described and talked and tried to interpret it and then my recommendation for people is you have to understand what is the core element of the construct. Uh, people think that if they see a, a, a measure that they need to write everything about the construct, you're gonna get a watered down item. So you've got to understand the core construct. So for the assimilation scale, what we believe what the core construct was there that one was being an American, and two was being black was secondary. And we had to figure out how could we write in different varieties about that. Um, for um, uh, the self-hatred, we thought that the, the, the core item was the fact that they did not like being black. How do you write about that? So I'm uncomfortable looking in a mirror. You know, I don't like being black and uh, or miseducated. You know, what don't people know? You know, what do they, what are the stereotypes of being black? So we wrote about people thinking they were all criminals or they were all drug users, but we tried to tap into the core of element of what we believe that was being theorized about uh, these identities and then tried to write toward that core. Now, when you do it, you're gonna get be wrong uh, about 50% of the time. So that's why the content analysis and getting people's feedback and doing reliability estimates are really helpful. 
because you begin to see which items coalesce together and which doesn't. Uh, right now, I'm being challenged. I, I have a colleague who is uh, going out into the schools and collecting diversity data. She's been asked to do that. So she wrote some items uh, on diversity. And she was adamant about that she wanted to write a scale uh, how do teachers um, view uh, pronouncing children's name, the language diversities that she said she'd heard kids talk about that, that, they, that they mispronounced their name. And so she wrote an item. And so she asked me to sort of do the preliminary analysis for her. And it was hard for her to get that despite her love of those items, those items did not coalesce well with some of the other diversity items. They did poorly. And I would try to talk to her about it, but I know the students were saying it. I said, but here's the problem. When you looked at the range of scores, she had a scaling from one to seven. Most of the teachers scale from four to seven. So either they were uncertain or they were pretty sure that they were doing their best with their names. So it's a, now a self-perception issue. The kids perceiving you're screwing up my name and the teachers perceiving I'm doing my best effort. So which means that there was not diversity or enough heterogeneity to get a, a stable reliability estimate, but it was hard for her to digest. And that's the piece when people don't wanna take the evidence and say, this is not the core. This is not the core issue, or you're not gonna tap it this way. You're gonna to have to tap it another way. I hope I answered that question. We may have time. <laughs> <laughs> we may have time for one more question. You should take it, Josh. Yeah. Oh, boy. Um, so many quite like technical questions. But actually, one thing I'm interested in is um, in your work, looking at this topic, have you noticed any secular trends or, uh, or developmental trajectories as you look at these constructs over time? I'd be really interested just to hear substantively about that. There's two things that you said that sort of resonates with me. I am frustrated um, with uh, the line of research because one, people are still referencing his 1971 theory. And then there's a conflation of then referencing, they, they write about the 71 theory but they put Cross and Vandiver 2001. So I find it frustrating that, that people don't wanna be literate about the topic, and that's one. Uh, and, and it gets published that way. So I'm worried about uh, that. Um, you know, I've seen some meta-analysis where they've used multiple racial identity scales and their assumption is because they eyeballed what the items were, that the content was the same. And, and I've had to tell some people that at conferences, they, it wasn't a pleasant conversation, but. I am challenged when people are lazy and not do the work because there was a number of research has been done to delineate that the scales aren't measuring the construct the same. So I'm, I'm troubled by um, the um, problems in the research and the theorizing. And that's why I say about evidence matter. There's still this belief that, that racial identity, um, uh, 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 if you have a higher level of black identity, predicts um, um, esteem, and it doesn't. It, this is a measurement issue in terms of there are a number of confounds in some of the measures that are out there. And so if you do that, the confound is gonna show up in the outcome. And so people don't look closely at those confounds. We have found that when you uh, separate this issue of self-esteem out of the measure, you will find that only when somebody is in uh, uh, really don't like themselves, you see esteem issues. But assimilationists can still have high self-esteem. And that's the piece that people don't want to believe. They believe that if you're assimilationist, you must be effed up. And that's not true. Uh, and so the way I query people about that, I ask them a question. Do you have an assimilationist uh, relative? Yes. Are they effed up? really long pause, no. So, and then I keep asking them about, so do you have somebody who is really together as a black person? Yes. Do they ever experience depression? Pause, yes. Because this idea of sort of conflating 
that if you're black, you're just always all right. And then if you don't act black enough, you must be effed up. And that's the piece that bothers me about the research because people don't want to embrace the complexity, the heterogeneity of black identity and that they need to separate those pieces out. That, that's, uh, that's, what, that's what my concern is because when you're trying to push the discourse and people push back by this simplistic thinking, but it also gets published. And so now we have still a cultural bias that exists in the literature. Thank you so much for answering that question and for joining us today. Please uh, join me in thanking Dr. Van Diver once more for joining us. This has been an amazing talk. Thank you. I've enjoyed you. myself and thank you for inviting me. Have a blessed day. Thank you so much.